Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Alan Frame. I'm president of the board of the Camera Club of New York, and I teach at School of Visual Arts. Um, it's great to see so many people here. We appreciate this collaboration with School of Visual Arts, who let us do this uh, photo lecture series here every month through the academic year. Um, news about the Camera Club, we have our annual photo benefit auction coming up on November 7th at 25 CPW at 62nd Street and Central Park West. We also have a show coming up in our guest curated exhibition series at our space on 37th Street. That's November 9th. It's a show called Other Places, curated by Tema Stauffer. Um, and it's a show that she's created from uh, a show that she put together for the site culturehall.com which if you're not familiar with, I encourage you to check out. It's all one word, culturehall.com. For the last year, they've been putting um, group shows up on this site with really well-written text, and it's a really good selection of emerging artists, so it's a great resource. Tema is drawing from that and curating the next show for us. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces here tonight. It's great, a lot of photographers in the room. Uh, we would like to thank the Mexican Cultural Institute of New York for joining us and bringing, uh, well, they have brought Yvonne to New York all the way from Mexico for this lecture. And uh, it's our second collaboration together, which is really exciting. Last year, we did a conversation series talk with Livia Corona, who's sitting right over here, who, uh, talked about her new book, and Omar Gamez, who was here also, thanks to the, the support of the Mexican Cultural Institute. Um, I've known, it's such a pleasure for me to keep up with Yvonne's work because I've known it since she was a student at ICP in 1996-97. I think that was the year, right? or a year later or something, anyway. Um, and to have had the chance to see it evolve into something now that has so much depth and complexity and to have followed it throughout its stages. Um, Yvonne grew up in one of my favorite cities, Tijuana, which I think is one of the most interesting places I've ever been. Uh, to, to, you know, as you know, Tijuana is this border city across the border from San Diego. Um, she grew up and went to school there, and then after living in New York and going to ICP, she returned there to do uh, this series that she's going to show tonight, The Most Beautiful Brides of Baja, California, right? Um, Yvonne's father was a studio photographer and wedding photographer and a portrait photographer in Tijuana. Uh, he's my age, so that generation, and he's still photographing there. And throughout those years, he um, was working with all the families of Tijuana who were constituting the first bourgeoisie of Tijuana. So it's interesting that Yvonne went back and um, looked up the women that she had gone to school with who were now, you know, in their early 30s with children and husbands and as a single woman as, with a professional career looking at the road not taken and creating this really interesting portrait of that segment of Mexican society. Um, as she sort of finished that in-depth portrait, she decided to concentrate on one of those women, and then she did a kind of extended portrait of that woman and her husband and family, Maria Elvia de Hayek, who was married to the former mayor of Tijuana. Um, it was a very wealthy uh, man. They lived in incredible opulence with their own um, stadium and zoo and security team and so on. And Yvonne then tracked them and presented that work 
last year at Shoshana Wine Gallery in Los Angeles, and there's a book um, that came from that project. And hopefully, someone's supposed to be delivering that book tonight. We might have it by the end of this. Um, and I was talking with Yvonne in Tijuana once uh, about why she had gone in that direction. And then it occurred to me that that kind of bubble world of people with that much privilege and wealth is sort of like a celebrity's world. I mean, they are celebrities in that context. And that's another interesting aspect of Yvonne's life is that she's had to deal with celebrity-ness because she's the twin sister of one. Her twin sister is, you know, a uh, singer-songwriter who's extremely well-known in Latin America. So that because they're identical every time Yvonne goes outside for any reason, she's very likely to encounter that kind of fan recognition. So dealing with the Hanks in that kind of world, I think, is in some way, maybe, a kind of reflection on that aspect of you know her experience with her own sister and what's happened to her because of it. She, it's not her only sibling. She has a large family, and I'll let you hear about it from her. But um, let's see. She's also been acknowledged by the government of Mexico. She's won one of their grants for young artists. Um, she's been in a number of group shows. I want to backtrack and tell you why Tijuana is especially interesting to me, because I think a lot of Americans don't know anything about it, except if you're from Southern California, you think, you know, you know its tradition of this, as this kind of sin city across the border where anything goes. Um, but Tijuana became a really unique art city and a really important place where international artists went to do projects, especially public projects, and there's quite uh, a significant artist community there. Um, a number of people teach at University of California, San Diego, which is where a lot of people got their MFAs and wound up teaching, and a lot of people like Yvonne herself got MFAs there. Yvonne went back and was doing that project and then just went to San Diego to you know, get this degree. Um, Tijuana is also the largest border crossing in the world, with three million people crossing in any given year. And uh, you know, with that come a lot of complexities. If you're a native of Tijuana, you can cross back and forth and do your laundry on the American side and come back and whatever. But you know, if you're from anywhere else in Latin America, you, you, know, you have to have a legal status to cross. And so there's a lot of illegal activity about immigration and a lot of illegal activity concentrated in the drug culture. And, you know, at this point, we Americans only hear about the drug culture in northern Mexico. And Tijuana is special, and that's why I'm making a point of it, to say that um, it has its own, like, sophisticated, highly developed art culture that's a completely different one from Mexico City. It has different liaisons and contacts. Um, and the thing that I like most about it is the artists who work there, a lot of whom work conceptually, use that experience. They don't avoid it. They steep themselves in the middle of all of those teeming and provocative, rich subjects, um, which they access through their work. So I think, Yvonne, you're the first uh, speaker we've had from Mexico. Levon is now living in Mexico City in this series. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you. And I now present Yvonne Venegas. Hi. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, the Cultural Institute and Camera Club, for having me here. It's a great honor. It's a great honor to have Alan introduce me. He, he, he. His teaching at, at oh, I'm, I'm, I'm shorter than you are? <laughs> I guess so. Um, his teaching at, at ICP was something that transformed the way I saw photography and how I, I perceived my work. So, so it is a, a really big deal to be back in New York and have Alan introduce me. It's all very exciting. So, and I'm staying at a friend's house in Harlem, which is where I used to live. So it's all very, it's all very exciting. 
Um, but I, I brought um, some pictures. I'm going to start with some pictures that introduce to introduce my work, just because uh, it's pictures of my dad. Um, I went into my dad's archive about a year ago, no, about two years ago, and I and I went digging into his 70s pictures, like between 72 and 75, and I pretty much uh, started looking into the images as something, looking for something, obviously I think what photographers do as editors, they end up looking for stuff they would have liked to have shot, and I, I, as I edited this work, I, I really did look at stuff with if I would have been there, this is what I, I would have loved to have taken this picture. And sometimes, you know, the pictures, obviously, I think that uh, this is the period of my father's studio. He's still working, by the way. He's still shooting weddings. He still wakes up at, you know, 12 in the morning the next day saying, why did I do that? I'm so exhausted. No? And more and more. But he's 67 now. I think you could be my big brother, not my dad. <laughs> Um, uh, but from this period, he was still not completely finished, if you could call it that. His, his work was still a little bit raw, like he didn't know what he was doing. He was still um, taking pictures and he, he might, might, you know, he didn't know if they were, if they were going to sell or not. Um, later, he became obviously a lot more practical and commercial and just would shoot stuff that he knew were gonna, was going to sell. So what I appreciated about this work is that I found things in the archive that perhaps were never bought, perhaps were never, were seen by the bride and said, never mind, and were forgotten and left in this dusty room where my dad keeps all his negatives that I keep insisting he is my inheritance so he can't get rid of it. <laughs> um, uh, and actually found this like beautiful uh, sort of document of precisely the period that Alan was talking about, which is the time of Tijuana when the, the the middle class was building itself and he was one of the, you could say, ground stones of that building because people would have the picture that might, obviously not picture like these, like this is a result, obviously not something that was ever gonna sell. No, this is a good example of it. Like the guys wanted a picture, they he wasn't gonna sell it to the guys, but he was obviously having social interaction with everybody at these events, no? Um, so, yeah, this is Ms. Baloyan. I think she's amazing <laughs> looking. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the construction, the, sort of the being part of that sort of construction also made, gave my dad a particular character, which is the one w that I grew up with and which is sort of the, why I consider is the one that built uh, the groundstone for my work. Um, it had to do with sort of wanting to be perceived a certain way. I mean, as being the, the sort of the social photographer of this group of people, he also wanted to be a part of it. And he wanted his girls, his daughters, he had lots of us. We were five girls and one um, brother who grew up together. And he wanted us to be a part of that social scene, to be married with these uh, high, you know, rich guys or be great housewives. But he always had a conflict with them. It was all just a very painful upbringing. So. It didn't work out, obviously. <laughs> I ended up being becoming a photographer, not a, a rich, uh, married woman with kids. Um, but so, sort of growing up with that tension gave me a perception of of how I don't know. I, I, obviously, this took me a long time to understand, but gave me a perception of this whole thing about understanding or wanting to understand people as perfect or their image should be perfect, which is obviously what commercial photography uh, seeks to do, um, my mission became contradict that and sort of make it break the surface. The surface was always so, had to be perfect and I, and I kind of insist on making it look human or making it look unperfect in a way that parallels uh, my dad's work because I I came to the moment where I, the moment where I kind of feel that everything came together is when I started to use a medium format and obviously it parallels the work that my dad did with his Hasselblad in a way no so the, the sort of the 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 crispness or the clear um, how you wanted to I wanted it to look very clear and for you to be able to see large format prints and to look exactly of what I wanted uh, the, the viewer to look at and for it to look really clear, no? be, be in no doubt. So with that, I introduced the, this, these, um, I'm gonna show you a few images from three different projects um, and actually five of my 
current project, which just a little taste, <laughs> just a little teaser, so you guys, you know, stay open and waiting for the for it to grow. But um, uh, this project is the one that Alan mentioned. It's the one that I was producing while I was living here in New York, and I started to go back to Tijuana and sort of find these girls and, and revisit them and photograph them. Um, a lot of the issues that I was sort of carrying with me when I was here in New York were precisely that, that I, was, I wasn't uh, sort of doing what, I, what was expected of me, but that didn't feel like it was freedom. It felt like a bit of a, a weight because I was, I was alone and I was kind of getting a bit depressed and I was 30 and it was all a bit like, oh. So I started to go see them and the, the encounters were not always uh, like, I wasn't really looking for happy pictures. The pictures that were, attra that, um, were attracted to, attractive to me were the ones that um, things seemed a bit tense and they seemed a bit uh, sort of, not sad, but odd, <laughs> you could say it. And, um, mm. One of the things that I can say um, about, I mean, I don't know if all of you know Alan's work and, and have studied with him, but I know a lot of people do. And one of the things that, I, that were, were important to me when I talk about uh, Alan's teaching is the ambiguity, like the, the thing about not, not looking at, not making a picture about a specific event and leaving things a bit open for and subjective for the viewer to sort of analyze and, and make their own conclusions, that was something I learned and something that I have applied to my work and has become really an important part of it. Um, obviously, it's also a bit of a part of my character, but <laughs> it was a good coincidence. Um, so the, the sort of what I was trying to do with these women was um, in a way, in, in down deep, I was I wanted to criticize them because they weren't uh, they they were doing something that I couldn't do because I wasn't cut out for it. Even though how, because my dad tried too hard to cut me out for it, so I was kind of um, uh, pissed off a little bit. <laughs> so in a way, my my but my critique sort of uh, my character is not to criticize directly. It's not. Um, there's there's uh, actually, I think, other photographers who are capable of making a clear criticism or even a cartoon. Um, there is actually a Mexican photographer who does that very well. But um, in my case, I, it's not my character to, to criticize. My, my critique is a bit more subtle, and you get it if you really pay attention, I think. No, and, and that, for, my, for uh, when I produce work or when I, when I see the results, I hope that that's what happens. That they're not pictures that you can see and understand exactly what I'm trying to say. I want, you know, it's like things are a little bit, it takes you a little bit, a, a bit longer to understand. And if, I think the biggest compliment that somebody can give me is that they say, I, I didn't get your work right in the beginning, but I can't get, I can't stop thinking about it. No, that's like, a, that's like big flattery. Like that one picture and they specify and that's like, okay, that, it's kind of working, you know, it's kind of hopeful because I, I feel that it is working what I'm trying to do. You know? And I think it goes back to, the, to this fight with the commercial and this fight with the obvious. No, I hate, I hate, I just saw a video by, um, I mean, a, a documentary about this uh, Mississippi photographer, what's his name, the color one, the one, Eggleston, where he's at war with the obvious. I, I didn't like him at all because I thought he was quite obnoxious, but I think that it's, it's I, I relate to that saying that I am at war with the, 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 I mean, not at war, that sounds a bit dramatic for me, but you know, <laughs> at war, so very dramatic, but anyway, but so so um, something that happened to me with, the, I, I, I feel that each project, um, this, this is my first long-term project, it was four years. Um, previous to that, I had done other projects that I considered the longest was two years. And um, something that I understood when I started it, or it took me a while to understand, was there was a conflict in Mexico, particularly, um, about what is a documentary photographer. No, it's like I, I had a lot of conversations with uh, photographer friends, such as Maya Godet or, or Katia Brailovsky, who studied in New York as well. And I kept saying, my work isn't documentary because I can't apply to the Eugene Smith Award with this. Who's going to care about these rich women and how they live? It's like, that, you know, so that kind of excludes me from this, this stigma of being a documentary photographer. But then they were like, you're crazy. Why, why is that? So there's always this question about whether, what is documentary? What, what exactly am I looking at? No, I, I, 
obviously you end up sort of giving yourself your own titles and that works better and that's easier, makes things easier. But um, the, the thing about, for example, I had a lot of conversations with Mexican photographers also uh, while I was, um, I had a grant in, in Mexico, we get we amazing grant programs and I had one where you have a conversation with two tutors which are two photographers and their questions was, one of them is Marco Antonio Cruz who's a very well known photo uh, journalist who does beautiful work but obviously is quite different to this and his question was like, well, you want you want to be a little bit more intimate. You want to get intimate. Where's you know where's the the bedroom and where's the underwear? Like obviously intimacy. Uh, I mean, it was important to me he to hear this because it it made me clear out what I consider to be intimate. And uh, intimate to me is more has more to do with finding the fragile moments. And for the traditional documentary, it has more to do with finding the moments that we consider intimate in a sort of classic point of view or sort of, I mean, I wouldn't let all of you guys come into my house and see me in my underwear. No, that's intimacy, that's a way of intimacy. But in photography, I see it as, uh, I, 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 w the, the moment where things break apart and you're not prepared, I think that's the kind of intimacy that I'm interested in. And also another one is that uh, I, dis I sort of came to terms with the, thing about I would th this try uh, this try this this to keep trying to be documentary uh, quote unquote I would tell the girls like okay so maybe I can photograph your daughters after they come home from school you know and you imagine these girls with like their hair unmade and the way you came back from school normally you know it's like and she and and like this happened particularly with the with the girl actually the one that's back here I'm gonna go back to that picture um, and it was yeah yeah come back and you know just photograph them when they're doing their homework after they get home from school so I expected these girls with you know like uh, candy on their face or something I don't know and I get there and I get these two girls dressed in the beautiful same color pink their hair is totally you no know, glued on and everything and and first I was a bit like oh bummer frustrated. But then when I saw the result, I thought, actually, they, they're giving me something of themselves that is, is what I should be, that, that I have to understand, which is they were showing me how they, how, what did they think about having the camera in front of them. This is how they respond to the camera. And that's, that's more intimate, I think, and more uh, endearing in a way, because they are a part of a social class that they want to be a part of, and this is, how they want to be presented. This is how they want to be remembered. No, and that is sort of what Pierre Bourdieu talks about in his his beautiful book of uh, I can't remember the name. Somebody must remember the photography of Middlebrow Art, right? <laughs> um, and that's what it is. It's like we want to be remembered in a certain way. And in this case, in this social class that I was analyzing, people wanted to be remembered like everybody else. They all want to look the same. No, that's what I felt, um, that women have a pattern of how they, they, they want to be looked, they, how they want to be seen. Their hair looks a bit like Jennifer Aniston, their body too, um, and the way they dress too. You know? So it's a bit like we have a, we're so close to LA. You know? we, we do have access to, to wearing, wearing all the brands that, that all the superstars wear, and they're cheap. We can buy them at the outlets right across the border. <laughs> So it does make a difference. It does create a look, a culture, like a, a look that's a particular of that social, um, of that social class. Um, and well, let me see. I, I don't know how many more I have of this project, but um, just to ra to sort of close this project up, I think that the the main conclusion to me was. It was an intuitive experience. I, I went through this project uh, for four years. It was two of them I was in New York, two of them I was back in Tijuana. And my, sort of what I was looking for, I didn't know exactly what I was looking for. But in the end, I think that it, it, it led me to, to understand the few things that I already mentioned. But it also led me to Maria Elvia de Hank, which is the woman that I photographed later. And uh, so we're actually going to go. We're going to go through another project before we get to Maria Elia. But um, something that I was, I think that this project in particular, I don't even feel that it's. When I see it and I try to edit it into a book, I feel that it's not quite f as finished as the other, as as the one I did after. Obviously, it's a little bit. Um, it, there's some loose ends I feel. No, and I think that's that's.
fine because it, it is what it is, no? Um, it, I, it was a very emotional trip, you could say, from beginning to end. I, I, I really, the, the beginning pictures, I had that feeling that I mentioned before that I was a bit tense and upset. And at the end, I actually became friends with a lot of these girls and I came to respect what they were, that what they were doing, that actually having a partner is not easy. <laughs> Having kids is not easy, and everything they had, the, the sort of the road they decided to take was is, is not, it wasn't really uh, the easy one, no? Um, this picture uh, is in Maria Elvia's, the first party I went of Maria Elvia's. Uh, I just want you to remember, because we're going to go through another project before I go back to Maria Elvia. But um, uh, I was, a friend of mine told me, you, ha you, ha you know, if, you want, if you're going to photograph, be photographing at children's parties, you have to go to the Hanks children's party, because they are the parties, los parties de los parties, way, no? The parties of the parties, no? <laughs> um, uh, parties is what we call in Tijuana the children's parties, no? Um, obviously not in the rest of Mexico, but, so I went and I felt that there was something there, it was fabulous, um, it was, I, I, I couldn't explain it, I will talk more about it later, but it, it the pictures that I did didn't seem to f work with the project that I was doing at the time. I mean, this one did, in a way, but uh, there were other pictures that couldn't be used because the, the maids were uniformed, and that's not the, 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 the middle class that I was photographing, um, no matter how, there, there is a, like a level of pretension, but the hierarchies were not really mixed in yet into how they sort of um, view their lives. So, so okay, so I just want you to keep that one in mind. But anyway, this is, this is the last of that project and I, 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 I have no words. I mean, this whole thing about dressing the same and I don't get it, but I still don't get it. <laughs> but um, anyway, so the next project, I'm just gonna show you a few, uh, like 10 images of this project. Um, this is something I did in between the two, uh, the brides and uh, Maria Elvia. And this was an invitation that I got from Fundación Televisa in Mexico. And they, th they had seen the project of, of the brides. And Mauricio Maillet, which is the, the art director or the art director of the foundation, um, invited me to go and shoot in a soap opera the way that I shoot, the, the, the way that I did the project in Tijuana. Um, the soap opera is called, it was called Rebelde, it doesn't exist anymore. You can find it on YouTube for sure. But it, it basically, why I thought it was perfect for me is because um, it, it, the, the soap opera is about a um, upper class uh, uh, private school in Mexico City and sort of the romance that goes between six uh, of the characters in the soap opera. And then those six people, the actors, actually tour in the real world and they have concerts and they play the songs. So in the soap opera, th there's this sort of like uh, thing where they're creating a band and you see the whole process. They go see the label guy and, they, and then they start practicing and then, and then they, do the, they do their shows. And so when you got, it was just a huge phenomenon. It became the biggest phenomenon that Televisa has ever had. It was a major million seller, millions of albums, and people were completely crazy about this sort of becoming or taking this identity and making it theirs. I toured with them, or th the tour, it sounds really glamorous, but it, they really work their asses off, these kids. Um, they would go seven, like five days in Mexico City shooting the soap opera, and then the weekend they would go out and play concerts in the US. So I w actually went to seven or eight cities with them. It ended here in New York at uh, Madison Square, completely packed of Mexicans and other people from the rest of Latin America. Um, but it was a, it was a, it basically to me, it, it, it was, I looked for the same thing that I had been looking for. This idea of Televisa has a very specific way of creating beauty models. They make everybody stiffly perfect and completely unreal for the Mexican culture. Like this Anaí, who's it's adorable girl, but she's not only anorexic, but she has fake ass, and I hope nobody here knows her. She's really sweet. <laughs> Um, and fake hair. Um, so th this creation, you could say, of, uh, of a model is um, it's something that obviously is not real for Mexicans, no? When you see what we Mexicans actually look like, no? And, um, 
I, I, I enjoyed doing this project and also because of what Alan mentioned of my sister's sort of fame or people would confuse me. They would think that I was Julieta taking pictures of people, uh, the public. It was very odd and made for really uh, surreal situations and I think that adds a layer to the work, honestly. I mean, it's not something, I, I, there's something there that you don't quite know what it is, but it's that. <laughs> No, um, these are obviously, this was one of those situations where people started to kind of, there started to be a wave in the public. They were, I was, I was photographing while they were standing in line to get into the concert somewhere in, I don't know, Texas. And um, I'm walking by in the camera and just in my world taking pictures and suddenly people start to kind of like, like wake up, like this thing starts to, <laughs> like the bees when they're waking up and I'm like, oh shit, I think I have to get out of here soon. <laughs> But I managed to get a few of these pictures, and then as I walk away, obviously people start to stop me, and you know. But it's uh, it was really interesting and surreal, and I enjoyed it. I have to say, in this case, I don't always enjoy it. Something just happened to us earlier today that I was standing in. Um, uh, this is going to be the only anecdote I do of this, but it, it was too surreal that I that I'm standing in my friend's apartment. It, she lives on the ground floor. And the light is on, and I'm inside trying to finish this PowerPoint, completely hysterical, Oliver crying, and I'm like with my boob out trying to feed him. And this suddenly they ring the doorbell, and, and Livia says, open the door. I think it's, it's David. He's coming back. So I go and open the door, and the woman's standing there. Julieta Venegas? I'm like, no. What the hell? They closed the door on her face. I'm like, ah. <laughs> That is too much. That's not fun. But anyway, <laughs> there are times where it is fun. <laughs> so um, anyway, but just to, I'm going to finish this off by saying that there was something here that obviously touched on was the celebrity, was analyzing celebrity and thinking a lot about celebrity. And because this is a, a constructed celebrity, obviously, this is a group of kids that are put together by a mind that, you know, has to, has has an idea and it worked and they became very famous and this fame is almost like the energy that I would feel at the concerts were, was a little bit like um, like uh, I, I mean I don't know if anybody here is Christian I say this with all the respect but the energy of, uh, of no maybe it's not Christian I'm sorry fanatism like something that that is re almost religious like you see the Virgin Mary and you go ah no, or you see a, a, a idol that you that signify that means something. Obviously, I'm not comparing Virgin Mary to Anai, but um, <laughs> uh, obviously they're quite different. But the, there's a what it provokes emotionally is quite similar. Um, that's what, you know that's kind of what I felt. But anyway, just to round this up, I thought you could see what Mexican looks, what Anai looks on a Mexican. Not good. <laughs> it's very endearing. It's very cute. I. I I love these girls that are completely ignoring that their bellies are a little bit, you know, saggy, and cute. <laughs> and this is obvious, oh, this is Nina El Conde, another one of the actresses of the soap opera. And I thought this was an appropriate way to end the RBD. Um, this is the band altogether. So um, now I'm going to go into the Maria Elvia project. And I, and I thought it was nice to come back to my dad's work. I found these in his archive as well. This is Maria Elvia when she was 15. She was the queen of the debutante ball. And my dad is still photographing the debutante ball, as you saw in the, the picture of the debutante queen. That was my dad fixing the dress. Um, but uh, these are the, the she, uh, Maria Elvia grew up in Tijuana. She is daughter of an um, engineer and a uh, housewife. Um, and uh, I, I, as I said before, I, I became in touch with her again after many years. I knew her since I was a kid. In my other PowerPoint, that didn't work, and I brought it for you, and I didn't. Those pictures didn't make it. But uh, I have a picture of Maria Elvia graduate when she graduated from university, and my sister and I are sitting as props in the picture, and they're teaching us. Her and her friends, they're teaching us to read. <laughs> so, so there is it, the sort of the not a relationship, I wouldn't call it a relationship, but we knew each other since very young. Um, uh, my dad photographed her first wedding. Um, and anyway, this is Maria Elvia now with her current husband, Jorge Hank, who was the ex-mayor of Tijuana. This is an, an exhibition that I had in Tijuana. Um, I, I had my MFA uh, show in San Diego, but for me, it was very important that 
the f that the Hank family saw the work that I was showing and saw the work that I was considering part of the book. And my way of doing that is to uh, present this show in Tijuana in a gallery that, uh, uh, owned by Aldo Guerra and Hugo Lugo. Um, and the, it was quite an amazing experience because speaking of celebrity, it was, um, um, it was basically Jorge Hank, Maria Elvia, because I did a pre-opening. I did uh, the opening the day after where all my friends could come because I couldn't imagine. It was a very small gallery, so I couldn't imagine Maria Elvia sort of mixing in with Julio Orozco and the grease, my greasy friends. I don't know, it was a bit odd. So I, I thought we wouldn't all fit. But it basically, where we did the pre-opening was press, about, I don't know, 30 or 40 cameras, and uh, bodyguards, about five or six of them, <laughs> and Maria Elvia, Jorge, my dad, his dog, my baby, <laughs> and me. <laughs> it was quite an interesting situation. Um, unfortunately, I didn't photograph it. I'm very sad about that. So this is a picture I have, which is not doesn't give it justice. But anyway, I'll start mm, talking a bit about why I was interested in this subject. I guess for, for a lot of you, it might be uh, easy to, to know. But um, after doing the, the um, Tijuana work, there was, there was a moment that I just kind of realized I, had, I was going to start an MFA, and I didn't know what project I was going to do, but always I had this project at the back of my mind, like this has to be a project one day. And I had been photographing there between 2002 and 2006 already, going back to photograph the zoo or doing different things. And, um, and it just came to me like a like a bright light that it was obviously the project I had to do in my MFA. So uh, my dad was invited to photograph her daughter's wedding. And at the same time, Maria Elvia said, Yvonne should come and do pictures in her style. Kind of at the same time, I was thinking about how I was going to approach her. What, what was I going to write? What was I going to say? And Maria Elvia called my dad and said, I want Yvonne to come and do her thing. So it was like, OK, it's another sign. I have to do it. This is going to happen. So um, we went to the wedding. It was, a, it was quite an experience. It was five events. Some of, them pic some of those pictures are in here. But anyway, that was the beginning of the project. The, um, um, this, th what I, why I was interested in this woman is that um, everything that the world that, that has, is created, that they have created between her husband and her, obviously has to do with many things. But um, Jorge Hank is a very wealthy man, and Maria Elvia uh, knows how to make wealth look good. She likes to, she's very much about etiquette, and she's very much about um, making big parties that nobody's going to forget. So, so there, the combination of the two, obviously there's a history that I'm not one to go and tell all the, his, the political history of Jorge Hank, but because it's not exactly who I was interested, but there is a background, the background that holds uh, sort of this couple together it has the look of the old priista parties, which is obviously has to do with um, showing off power in a way. So together with Maria Elvia, they made this world where um, things are, are quote unquote beautiful. No, so what I was trying to do, or my challenge, was to photograph this world and and make it my own, sort of break the surface, as I was saying before, is sort of look for a way to make these make images that uh, break that perfection and find those uh, fragile moments again. No, um, the thing about this world in particular is that it has a lot more elements that I had ever worked with. There was a lot to juggle. No. Not only were there animals and there were um, bodyguards and there was dusty roads, um, basically they live in a land that's 60 acres. And in those 60 acres, uh, the things that live in there are uh, just, you know, a racetrack, a casino, um, the private zoo, uh, um, uh, a stadium, a mansion. Uh, the house of the veterinarian, the the horse stables. There's, it's like a little town in itself. No, so, so to me, the challenge was to photograph all this and make it one project. That was the first one. Another challenge that was important to me uh, was that the Hank family is is sort of not necessarily loved by all in Mexico. So either they hate him or they love them, and I was sort of standing in the middle. So, um, and I didn't hate them. 
no, I love them. I, I kind of they had one foot in and one foot out, and that's something that I that I had to find a way of describing. No, um, if I wanted, I wanted to find the language that could translate the form, the way of thinking that put all this together, and I really believed it was possible. Although in the beginning, it took me probably two years. I didn't see it. I didn't see anything. I guess I, I only, I was only shooting, and I, and I saw the pictures, and I think, oh God, it's all crap. I even showed it to friends, and they were like, oh shit, it's all crap. And it was all just a bit like, there's nothing going on here. This is really scary. Um, but uh, fortunately, I had the support of Maria Elvia. She she wanted me to come and shoot. So in a way, in a way, what I thought down deep, I know this is not very commercial thinking, but I, down deep, I thought, if it doesn't work, it was just a couple of years, you know, that I that I lost for shooting. It's not like it's not the end of the world. No, I can just say I'm sorry and, and take these and they're yours, no? Um, so every time I'd leave the, the after shooting there, every time I'd leave, I'd say, please, please let there be pictures, let there be pictures, no? Um, this picture in particular, uh, I did uh, when I was eight months pregnant and I was just very excited about shooting and I was very excited about being pregnant and everything was beautiful. And then when I saw the pictures, I, I thought there was nothing. I was like, oh, it's, it's a bear. It's like the bear just running around everywhere. It's like there's nothing, I don't know, nothing. And then it, it took me, uh, after those two years passed and I thought I had nothing, I, um, I had a baby, my first daughter, and um, it, I came back to the work and I saw it. It's like suddenly it's like, oh, <laughs> like it was all there. I could see everything and I discovered this picture and that was like a, that was a eye-opening experience because I loved it I, I, to me that also I'm happy that it still happens to me that I can discover things in pictures that I could I mean in the work that I shot that I didn't know what to expect that I didn't know what I shot and you go back and you see the context sheets and and then after a while you realize oh, oh god there's that there and I didn't see it before and I'm just going to add a little commercial about digital photography and something that all students, I think, should be careful of. Uh, delete, the delete, delete, delete. It's, uh, it's dangerous. I think that we don't understand our pictures until we see them later. It takes a while. It's not just like a, something that you understand right away. I think that right away, it's your ego talking most of the time. And then nowadays, everybody puts them up on Facebook and everybody says, oh, what a beautiful picture. And, you know, it was your grandmother and it was your aunt. It doesn't really... I don't think that the opinions count, but anyway, that was my, you know, that was <laughs> just a little parenthesis. I just think it's important to, you know, to consider that all pictures should be kept until at least you're 50. <laughs> no, at least. Um, but anyway, to go back to, to this project. Um, um, well, we're going to go to uh, uh, Q&A also. So if stuff I excluded, please, please ask me because... Obviously, I'm excluding a lot. Um, uh, the, there is something about, I mean, this picture, I put it in here just to mention how when I was doing the Bride series, I'm talking, I, I was telling you about the look, the, the look that people wear that they look the same. And there's something that happened inside of Maria Elvia's sort of world and that people would be uniformed a lot. People would wear this is the this is a T-shirt that represents uh, Cholo Squinkles, which is the the team that is now a big, big pride of Tijuanenses, but it's owned by the Hank family. And um, and people a, a way of showing their support is they everybody wears this T-shirt. Like all the people that surround sort of the Hank family. No, anyway, that's just a little mention about. Uniform. So, uh, working with Maria Elvia was um, it was important to me because I, I w in the beginning I was quite um, shy to look at things. I, I was a bit afraid to to look at certain things or to photograph certain things because I felt that I wasn't supposed to. Uh, I have a, ba a good girl syndrome and it's horrible. It's it, it's like I don't recommend it. Don't impose it on your kids. It sucks. Um, it, it like a lot of the time when I was photographing, I, I would be sort of carrying this thing, and, and that I saw things that I thought, oh God, I should have photographed that. Obviously, at once I left, so it doesn't do it doesn't do you any good. And um, I eventually, not that I that I that I I think it it made me a little bit braver eventually to learn to to actually stop and photograph it. 
you have nothing to lose. You edit when you edit. You don't edit when you photograph. Um, I kind of, that was my lesson. That was one of the important lessons in this, in this project, no? Um, I, I think that a lot of, um, I'm sort of now throwing thoughts out, but I think that a lot of what this work um, was about was strategy. Um, I had to negotiate with sort of the ideas that people had from the outside of the Hank world and the ideas that people wanted to see from the inside. And also the ones that I was carrying, those the, the good girl syndrome and the thing about, oh, they, they're probably gonna, I shouldn't show this, and I don't know, like there was always this fear. And eventually I managed to find a, like a, I think a balance. I consider it a balance, and it's probably a language, no, where I can describe things, and people can understand them, but they're not uh, blown, like thrown on your face, no. Um, I, I could say that um, it did. This work is is sort of it was the biggest challenge, obviously, of the ones that I of, that I've done so far. Um, and um, what I, I don't know, no, I'm spacing out, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but I'm, I'm looking at this picture, I hadn't actually put it in my PowerPoint before, but obviously to me is, this, is, this is the kind of uh, family picture that I like to see of this family, no? Um, a little bit, um, uh, a little bit broken, a little bit, the surface is broken again, no? Um, I think this is, to, let me see, I'm sorry, I just wanna see how many, okay, there, okay. Um, so, um, I'm gonna actually finish talking about this work now. Um, uh, actually, I want you guys to ask me because I don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that and I'm gonna go to the project that I'm doing now. Um, the, the project, uh, I'm just gonna show you five pictures of this project and then we're gonna be done and, and I hope that you guys have questions, but um, the, the new project that I'm doing is the first one that I do in Mexico City, and it's very exciting because uh, I moved to Mexico City two years ago, and I've been trying to start a project. I, it took me a long time, and I went back to black and white, which is um, sort of a, uh, my current mentor asked me why black and white. That was obviously Martin Parr, and he asked me why black and white if everything you're doing is you, you're known for is color, and I didn't know what to say. <laughs> Honestly, the, the question was a bit, it was, I mean, obviously my decision was quite intuitive. But anyway, the, the series is basically a portrait of the middle class in Mexico City. And I, wanna, I want it to be a big, big fat book of just faces. They're portraits, but when I say portraits, sounds maybe a bit more conservative than what I imagine it to be. I imagine it to be quite complicated and uh, where I, I intend to mix landscapes and I intend to mix, etc. And how I'm finding people is, both w two ways. One is through ads in the paper, the Yale style. I put an ad in the paper and people answer to that and we set up a time and a place to photograph. And then the other uh, side is the is photographers. I, I, I sort of set up with photographers a date and a time where they're f shooting and I can sort of add myself on to their shoot. Um, usually it's uh, commercial photographers, people that are doing uh, pictures of people. And for in this case, for example, this is a photo safari. I, I love photo safaris because things have to, everybody wants to make the same picture and it's really odd. I, I find it so weird and um, it, it, it like uh, a little bit depressing, but um, sort of, I, I try to find obviously a moment that to me is, uh, it, it's about identity. You no, know? it's about a sort of self-representation, how people present themselves to the camera and creating a, uh, view of the middle class through photography. It's a little bit nerdy, but anyway, keep your eye out for it because it'll be out. I mean, I'll be, uh, this I hope keeps growing. Obviously right now it's only a year that I've been doing it and uh, for the record that I have so far, I'm, stu I'm just in the beginning. So with that said, uh, I think we can go to questions and answers. Thank you very much for listening to my <laughs> lobby. No, but I'm just going to make one little thing. Right. So um, with the Q&A, Yvonne, we, we have, um, and thank you to our, the Camera Club's intern staff, mm. we have a microphone that will be passed around so the audience can hear the questions. So when you raise your hand, they will come. 
And also just in my introduction, I, I wanted to acknowledge actually the individuals at the Mexican Cultural Institute of New York. Um, Maria Elena Cab Cabezut, Apollonia Torres, and Jimena Lara, who um, brought Yvonne here. And thanks so much, Yvonne. For, yeah. <laughs> um, so you can call on them, and I'll go back to my seat. OK. So I just want to make a little announcement. The books, Nina came in with the books. So we do have the books. We will have the books at the end of the talk. Um, you better make it quick, because I only brought 12 of them. I carry them myself from Mexico City, so I hope you guys buy all of them. <laughs> so um, so do you, if we, we can start with questions now. Yeah, up there. Oh, wait for the mic so everybody can hear you. <laughs> I'm curious as to why Maria Elvia or whatever her name is um, called you in to photograph her, because uh, I guess that seeing your previous work, like you're clearly not a photographer that depicts like people in a glamorous way as she likes to be mm -hmm. thought of. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I'm curious as to what her reaction was when she saw like that picture that you just saw. Mm -hmm. Like I'm sure that's not, or I I feel like that's not a picture that she was like oh, this is like my great, beautiful, perfect family. Like, what was her reaction? Like, were, were you scared of her being like, of the whole family, I mean, because they're really yeah. powerful, just being like, mm -hmm. what is she doing? Like, what is this? <laughs> and showing, showing the Mexicans the opulence in which mm -hmm. they live. Yeah. Um, why she let me photograph, I'm, I'm not completely 100% sure. I have certain theories. And I can share those with you, but she's never actually told me. I mean, the reason she had told me why she let she allowed me to photograph is she said that it was because uh, uh, out of family, uh, like he knows she knows my father and she respects him. So it, it's because she respects my father and his work that she she feels you know like she knows me since she was, since I was a kid. So there's this love thing, but I don't think that that's the actual reason because I don't think she. I think she's quite more. Uh, aware of things than than that sort of innocent uh, expression of love. <laughs> um, uh, I uh, my theory is that um, uh, through Maria Elvia. Well, first of all, Maria Elvia has studied art history for a long time. Like she's been studying uh, different in Mexico. They're called diplomados, which I guess they're like certificate things, or I don't know how you call them. Um, where uh, she she goes to the Casa de la Cultura in Tijuana, and they have uh, a s seven weeks of I don't know Mexican uh, 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 Mexican artist, or it, it's, so she's been doing this for years, and she's interested in art. And I showed her my work. I went when I first went to photograph at her house. I went to see her, and I I showed her the Bride series. And you're right; it's not exactly a portrayal of how how she would probably want to be seen. Actually, in the other PowerPoint, I had a cover of Cara's magazine, which is a, like a, one of those glossies, no, where she's on the cover, and she looks, uh, her smile and her look is very much like of a diplomat. She, she makes herself look, she has a good control of how she wants to be seen in those situations. But um, I don't, I honestly, I, I don't, I'm not very sure why she let me, but she, she really did give me the freedom to do it. Um, when I showed her the book dummy, um, she did go through it and say, oh, I don't like this one, I don't like this one, and oh, I think you should take that out. And, you know, like, she, she was um, a little bit uh, suddenly out of nowhere because she had been quite cool about it the whole time. When I showed the book dummy, then she said, I want you to take that out. Oh, and I don't like that. And, I, and so I was like, oh, my God, she wants me to take that out. I really like that picture. That's really important to me. I can't take it out. So... Um, uh, in for a while, she there was a moment when Jorge Hank ran for governor in Baja California, and I was doing it was while while I was doing the project, and um, he lost the election, and I had gone to Mexico City t on a job for like two months. I came back to Tijuana after Jorge Hank lost the election, and and I couldn't find Maria Elvia for months. She wouldn't answer my phone calls, so I thought the project was kind of done for. 
And um, when I came, some one thing led, you know, whatever, one thing led to another, and I, she, I found her again, and she, she said, let's, we have to do this again, and we have to retake the project because it's not done yet. And this is a woman that, she introduced me to a woman that was sort of her PR, and she, she said, she's gonna be your contact from now on, and whatever you need, you talk to her, and and that's what happened, that I, that I actually became very close, we became very good friends with Martina, is her name, and she became sort of my guide in this world, in, I mean, in this world, I mean, in that world, <laughs> not in the world. <laughs> but, um, uh, oh shit, I forgot where I was going with this. Um, <laughs> terrible, sorry. Um, uh, why? And why, yeah, exactly, so, so Martina, I know, okay, sorry, I now I remember. Martina's the one that told me, you shouldn't listen to everything she said no to, because it was a moment when she said it, and she's probably gonna forget, unless she repeated it many times. So she gave me some, like, re way to read her that was quite important to me, so I, I managed to read her, and I did exactly that. I took the images, the ones that she that didn't matter to me that much. I took out, and the ones, hey, Barinka, <laughs> and the ones that 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 mattered to me, I had to ignore her thing completely. But one thing she did say is that she wanted to have all her children in it, and I didn't have them yet. So I still had to work a, a few more, like a few more. I was already living in Mexico City, and I went back a few times to Tijuana to sort of round that up and finish. Um, and I think that's. I answered both your questions, right? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, more questions? Oh, oh, it's on that side. Hi, I've, um, I've never seen your work before. This is the first time I've seen it. I can't even think of any flaws to say about it. Um, <laughs> oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> Uh, also, I'm just very intrigued to know what your process is of being amongst this like perfection that you say and being amongst all these people that to you have no flaws. Um, how do you, how do you approach that? How do you find the way mm -hmm. to kind of depict these people and find the flaws and photograph them mm -hmm. amongst all this perfection that you see in the world, in, in mm -hmm. your world? Mm -hmm. I'm just interested to know how, um, that, is, how that works for you. It's very intuitive. I mean, I, I like to work intuitively. Um, in, the, in the first project that I showed you, the Bride series, mm -hmm. Um, I used to get drunk a lot. <laughs> no, I mean, th that was my way of sort of going and immersing in that world. I'd, I'd actually get really drunk, you know, and some of those pictures, I, I was one of them. I was surprised it even came out, honestly. Um, but <laughs> but obviously in the, in the case of the Maria Elvia project, um, um, it's interesting. That's a, an interesting question. I, I don't really see myself from the outside, so it's kind of hard to answer. But um, I have to say that when I was photographing at the parties, many times people would say, are you Jose Luis Benegas' daughter? Because he had photographed a lot of their, their weddings of Maria Elvia's friends. And most of the parties is the same people, just sort of in different clothes. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, then the, and then the other question was, are you Julieta? So I had two things which I, I, I didn't mind at all. Like usually I think that at some point in my life I would have minded, but I, I actually enjoyed it. Like people actually gave me access because they thought I was a celebrity or I was close to a celebrity. No, and, uh, and that, I, that I had something to do with Jose Luis Venegas, who they all respect and they, appreci they appreciate their work. So that helped me navigate. That, that world, it, d it really did, and, and, and I'm quite thankful for it. Like, there's moments when I'm not, but at that, those moments I'm quite thankful because otherwise I, I wouldn't know how to navigate it. And um, how, I, how you put yourself, I think that it has a lot to do with situation, how I work. I like it to be a situation, and, and I kind of just follow my instinct on, on what to go for and what to do. Um, uh, the, the things, that I, I talk to people a lot. Like, I, I did go, oh, hi, you know, how are you? Yeah, 
you know, like, like I did that sort of a, a fluffy talk with a lot of people, and and I don't mind it. Oh, it looks so cute. Oh, thank you. Oh, what a great dress. You know, whatever. Do you want something to drink? Oh yeah, I'll have a whiskey. You know, <laughs> and that kind of because thing. Because it just seems that like the their world is perfect in their eyes, and you seem to kind of. Um, kind of flip it on them, but still make it beautiful, even though you're trying to pick out their flaws. It's it's if funny because sense. if I if I was looking for their flaws flaws, they probably would have kicked me out. Yeah. My, you know, years ago. Um, that I'm not really looking for flaws. That, that's the thing that you can't quite. Um, uh, since it's not like a, a clear statement of something, it's not a clear statement of flaws, then I have access. No, if, 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 I, if I was actually looking for, for straight on flaws, it, I wouldn't have lasted. No, but it's not my character to look for flaws. No, it is, it is. I'm a bit gossipy, but that's obviously not in photography. Um, in photography, I think that it has more to do with, um, uh, I don't know, soft, I can't, I can't, I can't really explain. I guess somebody else has to help us with that. But, but it, I think that's the reason why th that that was a way of navigating it and staying on as long as I needed. I had to stay there until I managed to figure out what the hell I wanted to say. No, so so in order to do that, I I had to. Um, I, I didn't. I don't feel that I. I didn't sacrifice anything. I didn't, you know, like say not say things that I wanted to say. I said everything I wanted to say, but I just had to figure out that language, no? When the project sort of started being presented was uh -huh. when this whole, uh, when uh, Jorge Han was put in jail. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and so I actually saw an article in a newspaper like, you know, criticizing in a certain way the, the, the work you were doing because, uh, you know, you were dealing with the rich people instead yeah. of dealing with the real problems in Mexico. So yeah. I mean, do you feel, have you felt that about the project? Um, like misunderstood, being misunderstood. Well, the thing is that the the subject is uh, is quite controversial. No, I mean, the, obviously, as I said before, uh, a lot of people love them and, and most people hate them. No, I hate Jorge Hank because he's way too eccentric because of whatever. There's many reasons why people dislike him, um, and he doesn't necessarily represent the figure of kindness and you know, etc. But um, um, I I think that what I what I'm interested in saying is not exactly for that place. You know, um, I think that it's going to take more years for the work to be fully understood, and I don't mind. I'm not in a rush. I don't need to, you know, I don't need to be. Uh, the, 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 the project had several moments where I presented it in Mexico. I presented the book, and all my friends were there, and that was it. Nobody else, no, no press, no nothing. Nobody else was interested. And then they gave me the Magnum Expression Award, and everybody was calling me and interested, and they wanted interviews, and that was great. And then Jorge Han got put in jail, and everybody was interested. It's like all the newspapers called me, all, everybody wrote me. Um, I just had my baby. Not that that was a reason to turn anything down, but I basically turned everybody down flat because that's not the place where this work belongs. And it, it, it would give you... Obviously, if you put it in context and you write next to it, Jorge Hank eats bears, and then there's a picture of him with a bear, you're like, of course, you know? But if you put a picture of this guy with his back with a bear and you don't know what's going on, it's very different. So I, I'm not interested in having that, putting my pictures in that context, and I don't, and I think that um, it, it's been received the way it's been received. It's, you don't really know how things are received until years later, I don't think. No, uh, something like this. And so since I wasn't intending to do a, a, a photojournalistic a view of this family, um, I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. No, we'll see with time. <laughs> time is the best judge. <laughs> so and there was a question down here as well. Sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, on your new project, um, I appreciate how class has been like a big factor on your work so far, just because of the environment that you grew up and like just because you were such like grew up in the right time in the right place in Tijuana and like with the group of that you know the class and how that evolved into the pl the project with Rebelde. Um, 
But how does it fit in now with the portraits of the middle class? Like why saying, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's portraits of the Mexican middle class? And mm -hmm. following that up, why are you choosing to contact people through the newspaper? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I was kind of interested in that. Um, I always like that way of finding people that the Yale girls use. Uh, because I find that it's sort of a, a, a tool of investigation, no investigation tool that that you wouldn't be able to do it to find things out otherwise. I don't. I'm very bad with strangers. When I want to photograph somebody I don't know on the street, I freak out, and uh, you know I'll walk over and there's this guy in this perfect light, so I'll go over and I'll say like, "Can I take a picture?" And he says, "Yeah." And so I think, tick, tick, tick. okay, thanks, bye. So, you know, three pictures don't do it. I have to take at least, you know, five rolls or something. So uh, I decided that a way to photograph strangers, I guess it's also a way of getting to know the city. I, I, I didn't, Mexico City is foreign to me, no matter how much time I've spent there. Uh, a way to sort of um, explore a bit more and get out of my house because I, you know, it's very easy to kind of say like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and so if I contact people and they say, well, I live in such and such place or let's meet in such and such park, I'll get up and do it, no? Um, out of interest of what's who, what this person looks like because I'm not really asking for pictures. But um, that, that's what the reason why I did it. Why the middle class? Um, I think that I kind of insist on the middle class because I think that they're the most self-conscious. Um, I saw, I was looking at the work of Tina Barney the other day, and and I, that's that's the upper class. No, that's aristocrats. No, that's our those are really really rich people. They have a really rich background, and I, I I'm not sure if I would be able to photograph them. <laughs> no, I mean. Um, the Hanks obviously are not a good example of aristocrats, no, because their their families don't have so many years behind them of wealth, no. Um, so th the the middle class in Mexico City is is growing and it's huge, and I and I'm curious of how they're sort of presenting themselves, no, how they're it, it's kind of I, it's it's already it's it's not quite finished yet. It's the, the people are still becoming middle class. It's still a little bit uh, wavy and and rocky and weird. So so I think that in these constructions is what I'm interested in. Things that are barely being built. Um, and why the way that I'm approaching it is a little bit nerdy. It's through photography. No, I do think it. I have been reflecting a lot on what's happening to photography and how uh, what uh, sort of how digital photography is influencing the way pictures are taken and it's influencing the way we are presenting ourselves to be remembered. So it's just sort of a reflection on that. It's That's how sort of I'm, uh, I see it, What I, how I mentioned this, I see it as a big project because to me, Mexico City is the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life, no? But, um, but I think, did I answer your question? I think I, I already did, no? Okay, <laughs> all right, good, all right. Um, more questions? I'm sure you have a question. <laughs> I mean Stanley. Stanley's thinking. He's thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is like, what is your conflict of being a woman from the north, from a conservative kind of education, mm -hmm. because I'm from the north as well, and to kind of like have this um, courage to portray uh, rich people in a very conservative country, which is Mexico, mm -hmm. which politics uh, are a, a big part of the country and rules a lot of the ideology. So what is, is does it matter that you're a woman? Does it matter that as most of the time you were like single until recently? Mm -hmm. And how, how is that going on with your work? <laughs> Well, um, being a woman in particular, I don't think um, it's funny the, because when I when I did the Bride series, it was a lot of questions about being a woman and how women uh, were, had to be had to look a certain way in order to be considered women. And when I was photographing in Tijuana at that time, I the way I was I had really short hair and I started wearing men's cowboy boots and I started to create a look for myself that. I mean, without being too, I mean, outside it might just be very normal, but there it was a bit like, 
freaky. Like it was, you know, like not not freaky, shocking freaky. You know, I looked good. I didn't look bad. <laughs> but um, but but it, the, I did sort of play with my look uh, very not consciously. Like I wasn't, you know, decidedly saying um, I have to to make a statement in how I dress. But I think I, I did discover that it worked. You did have to make a statement. And uh, because I was a photographer, I wasn't looking for, for a boyfriend. And I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a part of the female world either. So, so, I, so to, I had to find my own look. And I, and I did. That was one way of dealing with it. Um, and photographing the wealthy families, um, going on in the same sort of uh, thought, down that thought of the look. Um, God, it was a lot of shopping. <laughs> I mean, photo it, photographing in the in the Hank world, I had to obviously make a whole wardrobe for myself. I mean, n not that I was trying to make it different from everybody else, but I think I've gone. Obviously, I made your question sound very superficial of how to look, but it is important. It's like it is a question that um, you ask because. Uh, it, I did ask myself at times, like, what am I going to wear? You know, it's like I need to be quite specific about what I wear. I can't look sexy, that's for sure. I'm not looking for a man in this place. And I can't look, you know, th I don't know. There's several things that, that I did consider while doing. And actually, the, the, the time that I photographed the wedding, which was basically the, ti the time that I introduced myself to the Hank world, I wore... Uh, a Louis Verdad suit that my sister had worn for the Grammys, and a lot of pictures had been circulated. I mean, not that I was trying to, you know, <laughs> place myself in a in a specific sort of position in in that place. And everybody was at that wedding, so so I think it it kind of worked. No, it was plus it was hot green, so everybody saw me. So, but anyway, but um, uh, I think that the when you talk about the political situation, you, you the PRI has a very, um, se dice? Es un patriarcado, it's a patriarch, no? So it is a macho world that you're so, that I was exploring, in, particularly in the Hank sort of uh, world. It, it's, it's very macho. So I think it was important to sort of uh, hold my position as, uh, as a photographer and how um, certain, I had to make certain decisions that were quite simple but crucial, like um, uh, something uh, when I was at the wedding, uh, Maria Elvia's son asked, said, oh, come on, have dinner, w sit with me for dinner no, uh, at the wedding. And for me, that was a bit like, oh, that's really weird. I mean, why would I be sitting next to Maria Elvia's table having dinner? It's almost like I want to be a part of that world or something, and it's not... It's not going to work. No, so I obviously just kind of ignored the invitation, which was kind of stupid because Luis Miguel sang at the wedding. I could have just been really close to Luis Miguel, but anyway, I was <laughs> sitting at the back with my friends, <laughs> my safe <laughs> comfort zone. Um, but uh, I think, uh, did, did I answer your question? Yes, I you hope. did. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so there's over here, oh, Nina, over here and, and up there. Has the work been shown in Mexico City or to a general Mexican mm -hmm. audience? Not and yet. Okay, no. what do you, an do you have any anticipation about what that reaction will be like? Because I look at it and I think mm -hmm. this is a work that's extremely critical of, mm -hmm. uh, especially now with, with, given the context, and I know what you're saying about it not being tied to the times, mm -hmm. but it is. Yeah. It is tied to the times and it's tied to the social and economic conditions of the vast mm -hmm. majority that Mexicans live. Mm -hmm. And the opulence and the tackiness of it is, mm -hmm. is, is just so blatant. I'm, I'm shocked that they didn't say, oh my God, this is so embarrassing, because they're oblivious to it. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm curious, what, what have you, if any, from other photographers or the other the photographic community in mm -hmm. Mexico who tend to photograph the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, well, the, it is that the only other work that's been done of the upper class or the or this class in Mexico City is Daniela Rossell's work. No, I mean there's some other works that are emerging, but mainly the other one that talks about sort of that class that you're mentioning is Daniela Rossell. 
and she was like a punch in the face. And it was quite a sort of a, a intense receiving. It was very intense. It was it was um, used as a flag for classismo, and you know, like people were defending and saying, like, look, do you see, this is where our money went, and we all got robbed, and it just became part of this ridiculous world that these people have built. Um, I don't know what to expect. Um, the pictures are going to be shown in May of 2012 at the Museo de Arte Carrillo Gil, and that's sort of the only show that I have scheduled for them. Uh, no? Is that my baby? <laughs> <laughs> it's not yours? Oh, then that's my baby. Oh, my goodness. All right, guys. Love you. Bye. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, oh, God. Okay. Mom, baby crying. I'm not going to be able to focus. <laughs> not. No. Yeah, go check. Just, Can I, I go want to check? comment on that subject. Okay. Oh, my God. But I'm not going to hear it? No, well, I'll tell you later. So, <laughs> you know about that subject? It's... I had a graduate student at Pratt whose thesis work was photographs of older women in Palm Beach and Newport that he had access to through his stepfather and mother who live in that world. And he sort of misrepresented himself to them saying that he wanted to do a book on the stately families of America. and. Um, you know, actually, there's a, a range of criticality in that work. And it was just, you know, thesis work. That, uh, I mean, not just, that's important. But, you know, he wasn't out of school yet. And um, he made the big mistake during the project, because he had all of these people lined up to shoot, of uh, showing one woman the pictures. And she'd had, she was lifted and everything, but couldn't do anything about the sagging skin in her arms and wrists, and they were visible in one picture, and I, otherwise she looked quite good, but that detail completely freaked her out, and she threatened to sue him. She called the whole thing off. She called all of those other people and told them never to work with him, and some people did anyway, because he's really good looking and where it had gotten around that he was, so. <laughs> um, but, you know, when I saw seeing that work, I was just aghast you know, some of the pictures that he did, which I think he hadn't really meant to be that critical, but because of the camera that he was using and the lighting, it was overly intense. And some of the things were, you know, like a little smudge of rouge on the tip of the nose accidentally, or a whisker showing in a way, and a close-up of this prominent woman. And... Uh, <laughs> So, you know, he printed it all up. It was the thesis show, and he said, my parents are coming for the opening. Would you like to join us for dinner? And I said, have they seen this work yet? And he said, no, this will be the first time. And I said, I'm not going. <laughs> and I really thought it was going to be a big showdown. And in fact, they came, and they were like, they look at the pictures, oh, there's Miss So-and-so, and there's Miss So-and-so, and yeah, no, no, no. And for them, it, all of that criticality was invisible. It was just like, oh, you know, this is how we look. That's who they are. That's so and so, you know. And in a way, I think, you know, with these pictures, it has to be a similar thing. Of like, uh, you know, they might look at it like, is that a flattering picture of me, just in terms of pose and gesture? But, you know, the things that we maybe observe that are kind of shocking or in bad taste or whatever, it's like, no, that's what they intended and that's showing and so on. More questions? <laughs> I think I have to bring the mic down, no? Or okay, yeah, up there. We're all Hi. Hi. Sorry about the kid. No, Just crying. It's cool. Uh, my question is, um, what are your technical influences and conceptual influences? You know, when uh -huh. you were starting taking photographs, and of course, who were your favorites? Which people were your favorite photographer? I, you were I, learning. Uh, um, I've gone through several phases. Uh, I had my Diane Arbus phase. I had my 
any level bit space. I mean, I guess it's uh, kind of uh, what I consider, when I started taking pictures, I consider it to be 1990, 91. So I had, uh, it's been a while, so I've gone through many. But when I began to do color photography, which is when I came to New York in 98, I was looking at Martin Parr and I was looking at Tina Barney. And um, uh, now, for example, um, I've been looking at, there's this yeah, like young photographer called Jacob Aul Saul or something like that. Yeah, him and um, uh, the other one who did the work on, on Caracas in Venezuela. Um, who does, I, don't, I can't remember his name, I can't remember his name now, but um, I'm looking, like I keep looking at different people in different periods, no? Like when I started to do black and white, I actually went, went back to Detour, Alan's black and white book that he did, it's absolutely uh, very inspiring book, no? But the tech, conceptual, I think it's uh, the people that I, that I just make me go back to, to my questions, I think it's Tina Barney, I really like her work, I think it's a, it's a really, um, uh, for me, it's really important work, no? Uh, uh, I, who else have I, I'm just gonna think of who else I've been looking at lately. I can't really think now, but um, I am a working mother, so <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I hope I hope I, I answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever get to see the work of Sam Mann? Yeah, yeah, I, I've always found her a bit, s it's not gonna be the right word, but, uh, what? So, yeah, uh, a little bit soft, but I'm thinking about the soft focus. I just, I don't know, I, I, I like, uh, you know, there, there was this girl who got the Tierney grant um, uh, from Yale last year, um, Elaine Stocky, and I, 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 loved, I loved her work. I really thought it was really um, punchy and beautiful and, and strange, really, really strange. No, no, no. Uh, it, it, no, her name's Elaine Stocky. No, Sally Mann <laughs> hasn't really kept me up at night. I don't know. <laughs> ah. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, an 8 by 10 camera. No? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, any more questions? You're intimidated by the baby, I know. <laughs> I know what's happening. <laughs> Alan? Um, you're a generation of photographers in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, Do you consider, do you have a sense that there's some common um, generational identity? I mean, I know my mom's from, but you're from Mexico. Mm -hmm. I know you teach at Avi, and there are photographers there that teach, and Omar is a good friend of ours. And yeah. Do you, you yeah. know, as opposed to, you know, people like Graciela, yeah. Iturbide, and people of another generation who are really well known here. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because um, uh, I've always been a bit of a loner. It's very weird. Even when I was at ICP, I was like, oh, these girls, you know? Like, I, I never liked being a part of a clan or something like that. But, but when they asked me, what photographers do you like in Mexico, I always, they always, I realized that the ones that I mentioned are my friends, no? Um, and that's not a coincidence. It, it is the generation that you're talking about. Um, I do look at, at, at their work and I'm, and I'm interested in seeing how it develops, no? Like how they, 
they perceive another subject and how their, their eye sort of goes from one subject to another. Omar Gámez is one of them, Livia's work, I always talk about it in my classes. Um, Katia Brailovsky, I'm very curious about how she's developing because she doesn't want to show me anything. Um, um, <laughs> Maya, Maya Godet, I mean, we, were, we, we had a moment where Maya, Katia, and I were very close. We used to really influence each other in the work that we were doing. Um, uh, something happened along the way and we kind of all just went our own way and I'm now sort of going back to uh, sort of going back to that with Katya. Katya and I have stayed very good friends for, for a long time. And um, uh, Javier Ramirez Limon was very important for me when I was in Tijuana. He was the one that said, I don't see anything either <laughs> not in the work. Um, but I love his work. I, I, his landscapes I find that are just so dark and amazing. No, I think he's got like brilliant work. And um, there's a whole other generation of photographers in Mexico that I don't relate to at all. No, I, I really don't, like, uh, obviously, people, a lot of people do constructed work, of, you know? And there's a lot of new photography that's coming out that is quite interesting, I think. No, there's a lot, that it's like, it's uh, kind of uh, exciting what's happening, no? There is a, a school that Pedro Meyer opened, uh, and, um, the, the philosophy of that school is that anybody can take pictures with anything, no, with a phone, with a whatever. And I'm not sure I'm that excited about that school of photography, but um, I really like Pedro Meyer. <laughs> I think he's a great guy. Um, but that's a whole other world, no? But yeah, I think that uh, it is important for me to look at the work of, of these people, no? Like the, the, the group of people that happened to be, you know, who else was there? Um, Jose Luis Cuevas is another photographer that has Gimnasio de Arte, which is another school. And, and his work I, I find also very inspiring. You know? And that's the thing that uh, other, it's exciting when your friend's work is inspiring. You know? Like you see how they keep developing and keep going and keep going and it gives you the stimulation to continue. You know? And I think it was you that said to us that the, in the end the people that are gonna help you in your career are gonna be your friends. You know? And it's true. <laughs> <laughs> like you're, you're the people that you went to school with. For my CP, I have, I have, um, haven't really stayed in touch with anybody. You know, with like I've, I know what's going on with some people and stuff, but it's mainly in Mexico that I've sort of built or we sort of created our uh, generation. Or, yeah. Um, and any more? I don't know if you talked about this already, but it's something, it's it's probably going back to stuff we touched on while I was out mm -hmm. um, side with babies. The, and it relates to a question someone already asked about whether the people from, from these social classes you're photographing um, have any, uh, any, any sudden sense of awareness about their own aims at representation, but I also, I don't know if you've talked about how the, the force of Tijuana chaos mm -hmm. just seeps into their lives and, and how they try to manicure the lives around the, the aesthetic of Tijuana, which is uh, in, insurmountable. You can't really fight it, and it just seeps into the pictures um, of the surroundings of the Hank family, especially in those gardens that they build and that mm -hmm. sad little f fountain with the chain link, <laughs> chain link fence yeah. in the far back. I wonder um, if it's something that, one, the I'm sure you're very conscious about it, but it's, if it's something that is even acknowledged in these societies, in these mm -hmm. Tijuanense societies, um, that when you're in there. Well, I think that um, uh, Tijuana seems to always be under construction. There's always something being built or something is still being taken down and then put back together or something like that. And I do wonder if people are aware of it in a way that they're used to it. No, um, Maria Elvia never, she, she actually likes that picture that you mentioned of the flamingos and the little fountain, no, the one, it's called, it's called Lago, and there's, it's just like a picture of, the, uh, there was a construction of the stadium being done, so all the dirt that was taken out to 
take from that hole was put in a mountain on this other side of the of the compound, not the place. And uh, it looks like this very strange, dusty landscape. And um, I, it's funny because she never minded that, although she's very perfectionist. And she, uh, there was a picture that she asked me to take out of the book, and I did take it out because it didn't matter to me that much, which was uh, two dogs that were in front of a in front of a fence. But then she said, "This fence has already been taken out. You should. I don't like this picture." She was like, "This fence is not part of my house, so I don't want the picture there." She was quite clear about that, no. So it's in a way, it's kind of like the world that she that she that the the part that's important to her is her house. No, everything else is the world that surrounds it. No, but I mean, that's how, that's how I understood it. No, um, and for me, it's funny that you mentioned that because for me, it's it's really important that those two worlds are together. I mean, to me, that's Tijuana, like these very made up people uh, with this dusty background. No, that's like, that's that's what I what I that's what to me looks uh, is what uh, a society in the making looks like. No, it's a city that's not doesn't have a real structure. It doesn't have a, a set sort of buildings that you see w throughout your life because they're being torn down or because they don't function anymore eventually, very soon after you've seen them, no? Uh, businesses go out of business. Uh, they come back and then the building is used again, but then it goes out of business again and then it's torn down. and then it's So you kind of used to things crumbling a little bit around, no? And, and I like that. I think that's part of the identity of the work that I do, no. And um, and thank goodness I was never actually questioned about it, <laughs> you know, while I was doing the work. It's like oh, I don't want the dust to come in it. I'd be like, oh shit, that's part of the work. No, that's part of what I like about it. Um, uh, glossy nails and dusty robes. No, I think it's a it's a way of saying it. No. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we have 12 books, so run and get them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you.